Now you're good. No good. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everybody and thank you for tuning in for the BC Wildlife Park's very first virtual zookeeper feeding. My name is Larissa. I'm part of the animal care team here at the BC Wildlife Park. And before we get a chance to go and meet our star of the today's feeding, I just wanted to start off by doing a very quick land acknowledgement. Um, the BC Wildlife Park does sit within the traditional and unceded territory of the Sequetmik First Nations, or sometimes referred to as the Shushuak people. So many of the animals that reside here at the wildlife park have been deeply intertwined with the way of life for the Sequetmik for thousands of years and for the First Nations all across British Columbia. Uh, so we're gonna get started and go on in and meet Quilla and uh, have a wonderful snack for her. Let's go on inside. Now she's going to follow me outside here and then once she's following me, you can follow in. is participating in what we call target training. And so as you saw, she climbed up her ladder here and touches her nose to the end of our target pool. And this is something that Quilla has been trained to do for several years now. Um, all of the training that we do with the animals here at the park is done through positive reinforcement. So that means that Quilla chooses whether or not she wants to participate in her training uh, routines. So hopefully we'll continue to get her to do some more target training around the exhibit here. So Larissa, we have a question. What is Quilla's favorite food? Uh, so she loves uh, her slices of carrots and broccoli. Uh, so far she's had two pieces of peanut, which she also really enjoys as well. And what I've also brought for Quilla today, which uh, we'll have a chance to put out for her, is a little bit of fresh willow. Uh, so at this time of year, porcupines would be eating a lot of fresh uh, buds that are coming off of trees, um, which typically some of their favorites are going to be from poplar, aspen, and willow trees.
Um, so just a little bit of back history on Quilla. Um, she actually just celebrated her 14th birthday on April 13th. And she has been at the wildlife park since the fall of 2006. And she is one of the few animals here that did not come to us as an injured or orphaned wildlife. Um, Quilla was actually born at the Storybook Gardens in Ontario. Now with her being 14 years old, um, the average lifespan for a North American porcupine is between about five and seven years old. Um, so Quilla is definitely one of our more elderly animals here at the park. And because of this, we encourage her to get lots of exercise throughout her exhibit here. Now you may notice that Quilla is enjoying those carrots with some very big orange teeth. Um, porcupines are the second largest rodent that we have in North America. And one of the characteristics of the rodent family is that those big incisor teeth are continuously growing throughout their life. So a porcupine in the wild would have to find things like antlers that have been shed from other animals. Um, they also chew the under layer of bark to be able to help wear those teeth down. So another question, Larissa, why are you blowing that whistle? Mm -hmm. So all of the animals that uh, we do training with here at the park, um, with their positive reinforcement, they've been trained to know that the sound of the whistle means they've done what I've asked them to do and their food is going to be coming right away. Um, so we try to reward the animal as quickly as we can, um, but in some cases we can't do it right immediately. And so the sound of the whistle allows Quilla to know that she's done what I've asked and that her food will be arriving very shortly. So I think next what we'll try to get her to do is a little bit more climbing up here as well. Really demonstrate the porcupine's climbing ability here. As you can see, Quilla is hanging on to those pieces of food with those nice dexterous paws and she has incredibly long and curved nails on her feet. So those are really great for being able to climb. Now, we'll try to get her to come on um, down this log and to do some climbing for us. And that'll also give us a really good opportunity to see some of those quills that people are waiting for um, with the porcupine. <laughs> So another question, Larissa, why do you touch her nose with the white stick? Ah, so as you may have heard before, you may have missed it, this is called a target pole. So Quilla has been trained to touch her nose to the end of the pole here. And this can get her to move to different areas of the exhibit that we want her to go. So this is all part of her exercise routine to keep her nice and physical shape for her age here. Good girl. Now, as she was climbing, you may or may not have had a chance to see um, some of those quills that are situated on her body. Um, most people, when they're first looking at a porcupine, think that they're going to look a little bit more like a hedgehog with quills all over their body. And their quills um, are located from the back of their neck all the way down their tail. So you'll notice she doesn't really have any on her paws or on her face. And they are pretty hidden underneath these blonde and chocolate brown hairs, which are called her guard hairs. Um, but the quills do extend all the way from the back of her neck all the way down her tail. Now, the quills themselves can range from about half an inch long to almost five inches long, depending on where they're situated on the body. 
So the longest and thickest are of course going to be on the tail and on the lower back where most predators are going to be attacking them from. Now, one of the biggest questions that we always get about porcupines is can they shoot their quills off of their body? And the answer to that is no. Uh, this is a pretty big common misconception about porcupines. And in fact, their quills are, are a modified hair. So if Quilla were to shoot her quills off the body, that would be about like me being able to shoot my hair off of my body at you, um, which is not something that I can do and it's not something that she can do with her quills. However, when they are thrashing their tail to protect themselves against a predator, quills that have already been released from the muscle that holds them to their body, those quills can sometimes go flying. And that's just from the sheer momentum of her thrashing her tail or giving her body a shake. But it does give that impression that the quills are being intentionally shot off of the porcupine's body. Can you come on down? So you might get another good view of those quills on her tail if you're able to come along the side there. Now, right now her quills are relaxed, so you'll see that they are laying down flat on her body. But if she were to feel threatened or get startled by anything in the environment, the muscle that holds those quills to her body is going to pull those quills up and it's going to stand them erect, preparing for if a predator is going to be coming at them. Okay. <laughs> Larissa, is her fur soft or coarse? <laughs> It's a really good question. I've only really felt her fur when it comes off, um, when she sheds it. Um, she's not one that you would want to be too incredibly hands-on and have lots of scratches with, um, for a pretty good reason. Um, we'll see if we can find some of these loose quills that she's gotten on the ground and we'll get a, a closer look of them here. When you finish your biscuit, we'll get you to go back up. <laughs> Now, uh, I see a couple of the quills that I can uh, give a demonstration of. Grab one of them for us here. Good. Just while you're looking for a quill there, is there a reason that she went down backwards? <laughs> it's just the safest for them. Um, so she is an excellent climber, but it is still easier for her to go tail first. And in the wild, if there are any predators that be coming, um, she would be able to thrash with her tail if they were lower down than if she were to go head first. So that's just the safest way for her. Um, so while she's munching on that piece of lettuce, let's see, I might have to give her another one here. <laughs> there you go. Um, so this is one of the quills that has been already shed from Quilla's body. And you can see this is the part that is attached to the muscle that holds it into her body. Now at the very tip here, you'll see that black edge. Uh, if we were to have a very nice microscope or awesome zoom on that camera, um, you'd be able to tell that there are several dozen barbed hooks on that black tip. Now what those do is they engage underneath the flesh of a predator and when they get stuck and wet underneath the flesh, it actually holds the quill in place and it can help draw the quill further and further into the animal's body. So we'll be very uncomfortable if they are hit with many quills um, with their tail or if an animal goes and actually bites onto the body. Um, and then the quills themselves will start being pulled into that animal's body and can further cause damage by puncturing organs if they continue to move further in. They do also have the potential to cause infection as well. Now, it's also hard to tell, but these quills are hollow, so they're um, pretty air-filled, which, in, incredibly enough, actually makes these guys pretty buoyant. So, uh, certain times of the year in the late summer, uh, they will actually be found uh, swimming to get water lily out in small streams. And you wouldn't think that an animal this big would be a very good swimmer, but those air-filled quills actually make them quite buoyant. Good 
Now, um, quilts like these ones as well also have a pretty important uh, cultural use as well for First Nations across British Columbia. Um, here, the porcupine within the Sequatmic Nation is known as Sichuya. And porcupine quills would be used to put onto various types of buckskin clothing. Uh, they can also be used for different types of jewelry that would often be used um, to trade with neighboring nations and to be gifted. Here we go, Kola. <laughs> and there are close to 30,000 of these quills on a porcupine's body at a time. Good girl, Quilla. <laughs> Larissa, have you ever accidentally had a quill in your hand or foot while you ah, fed her? Good question. Uh, so I did once um, a couple of years ago get a North American porcupine quill in my forearm, um, but it wasn't from Quilla. It was actually from while I was a volunteer at the Edmonton Valley Zoo. And I was helping the zookeeper clean up and uh, do some feeding and I unfortunately was not as aware of my surroundings as I should have been and happened to brush up on a piece of furniture which then embedded the quill into my forearm. So I can tell you it's definitely not um, a feeling that you want to have and I was really fortunate that I only got one quill. I can only imagine the agony that an animal would feel getting thrashed with several of those um, in their body and especially near the face is where you'll typically get um, a lot of those happening. Now, porcupines are uh, preyed on by a number of species in the wild. Um, typically, their main predator, good girl, the main predator is a member of the weasel family called a fisher, um, but they are also preyed on by animals like um, cougars, bobcats, lynx, uh, even great horned owls and black bears have been known to um, be found with quills embedded in their body. Um, but the fisher is definitely the most skilled at being able to attack and go after porcupines. And as you'll see, she doesn't have any of those quills on her face. So the way that those predators will typically go after them is by getting the porcupine flipped over onto its back because they do not have any of those quills um, on underneath their belly. They'll first do, oh, see a little bit of those getting that. <laughs> What they'll first do is try to run away from a predator into a rocky crevice um, or up a tree. But if they are not able to do that, then the porcupine will have those quills standing erect and they'll keep their head tucked in between their shoulders and they will keep their back end towards that predator. And um, they'll typically at this point have a lot of che uh, teeth chattering going on. They'll stomp their back feet and that's when they'll start thrashing um, that tail to be able to embed quills in the predator, giving them a chance to scurry off and away to safety. What's their average lifespan? Average lifespan for North American porcupine is between five and seven years. Uh, so Quilla is uh, now 14. She just celebrated her birthday uh, about last week on the 13th here. Um, so she is definitely one of our more elderly animals here at the park. And because of that, um, her training and getting to do um, her physical routines here is an important part of her care here at the park. Uh, getting her to do her routine, to see how she's walking, how she's maneuvering, gives me an idea of how uh, how her muscles are still working, how healthy she still is. And we are very fortunate that uh, we have our health technician here that if uh, Quilla needed any type of medical care, we'd be able to get that for her. Now, Quilla is also trained with that target pole, but she is also trained to go onto a scale willingly for us. Um, so she is voluntarily uh, participating in weighing herself. Um, we'll keep measurements of how how heavy she's gotten. And she is also uh, trained to go into a crate. So if we ever have to do any big maintenance inside this exhibit, um, she will willingly go into a crate for us where we can take her out of the exhibit while we do some maintenance in the exhibit here. And what was she eating uh, when we were up close there? I believe that was a piece of lettuce. Uh, she has also been getting these or uh, small leaf feeder biscuits. And so those are specifically designed for herbivores in human care. Another question, I've heard if you come across a deceased porcupine that it's illegal to take the quills. True or false? Hmm. 
That one I'm not 100% sure on. Um, I know that certain parts of animals you definitely have to have permitting to be able to um, maintain those parts of the animals. Uh, any type of deceased body would be good to um, make aware, especially if it's alongside the road. Um, there's lots of road maintenance that you could let um, those companies know. Um, because if there is any type of deceased bodies along roadways, um, it is often an attractant for other animals as well. Um, so I'd always try to alert somebody that you have found the animal as well. Um, but I do know that in some cases, uh, members of First Nations communities are um, able to collect things like quills that are still for cultural uses. So there may be a bit of differences in the legalities with that. Um, but again, I'm not 100% sure on that one, so sorry. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to look into that into the future for sure. Can we get you to come on down? So for the rest of um, Quilla's diet here, I've run out of the, um, the small handheld pieces that I can get her to do. But next what we'll do for her is what's called a bit of broadcast feeding. Um, so this is going to allow Quilla to sniff around and search for the environment for the rest of her diet. Um, so this also encourages her to get exercise and keeps her kind of busy out here. One more little biscuit there. And then it could also give us a good indication of how, uh, how well of a climber she is. She often will still come walk directly up to me and try to get snackies, but I <laughs> don't really have too much more for you. You're going to have to look around for it now. <laughs> now she does also have that willow there too, which I'll try to put into some of the holes here for her. So there's usually uh, a few hiding spots that I'll go and I'll put her food so she knows a few of them. I haven't gone and been able to put any of them quite around yet. How long have you been her keeper, Larissa? Um, I think I took over primary care of Quilla just under a year ago, I would say. Um, I did have secondary care of her for a while, um, but yeah, I'd say probably under a year now. And we've definitely been able to build our relationship. It's a really important part of the care of the animals for you to have a good trusting relationship. Because again, with their training, uh, they do decide whether or not they want to participate. <laughs> Now I'm just gonna sneak behind you and grab that willow there too, Julie. Would Quilla be considered an exotic pet if you were to own one? And um, can you own them? Uh, you definitely cannot. Um, so housing a, a wild um, species from BC is not legal. Um, but I don't know if they would be considered exotic given that they are indigenous to the area. So this is some fresh willow that I got for Quilla earlier today. So again, this is going to be one of their favorites in the wild. In the wild, how many babies do they have and uh -huh. how long are they pregnant for? And do they just, uh, both the mom and dad? Are both the mom and dad involved still? Oh, okay. Um, so typically, they are going to give birth to a single pup. Um, and when they're young, I love this, they're called a porcupet. <laughs> um, so they typically are going to give birth to a single pup, but they sometimes can give birth to twins. It's just not as common. Um, typically, they are going to be pregnant for about 30 uh, 30 weeks, I believe. So um, depending on where they're living, they will breed between October and November. And the young are born between March and May of the following year. Um, so the mother is the sole provider for them. Um, they are solitary in the wild. So breeding season is one of the only times that they are coming together. 
Now, when the pup is born, uh, they are typically drinking the mother's milk for about six to 10 days only. Um, so they're weaned quite quickly. Uh, can take a bit longer if they're living in human care, but in the wild, it's just over a week typically that they are already off of their mother's milk and starting to eat uh, different types of food. And by the fall, they are typically gone from their mother, so they aren't staying with their mom for an incredibly long time. Now, when they're born, believe it or not, they uh, do have their eyes open and they already have quills. Um, but their quills are quite soft at the time of birth and start hardening within a couple of hours. And within a few days, they're able to follow mom up a tree and they're already fairly good climbers <laughs> at that time. And then they just learn from mom um, what types of food that they're able to get and she will, of course, provide them protection from predators during that time as well. Are we in need of, or do we accept other donations other than cash? Oh, absolutely. And so there are different types of food donations that we accept um, for animals at the park. Um, for animals like Quilla, with her being a herbivore, um, we typically with her diet, she is receiving things like carrots, broccoli, lettuce, um, but she'll also eat sunflower seeds. Um, some of her pellets that she gets are what we um, order in specifically for herbivores. Um, but we are also getting a lot more activity with our bears now with they're starting to be up. So we are taking in donations of different types of fruits um, for our carnivores. As long as the meat is within a year old and it is not seasoned or processed in any way, um, we typically will accept those types of food items. Um, but in that case, I would just encourage you to call ahead to the animal care department and um, discuss if that's something that we would be able to accept and arrange an appointment um, for drop-off if we can take it. That's a really good question. Thank you. <laughs> Do animals need any toys or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have lots of different enrichment items that we can provide for our animals, um, depending on the species. So um, we for the carnivores are looking for things like Kong toys. Um, but again, just give us a call at the department to see if it's something that we would be able to take. Um, enrichment is an incredibly important part of the animal's life. So uh, for animals like Quilla, we're able to put food around her exhibit and allow her to go through those natural um, instincts to be able to find food items. And for other animals that have an excellent sense of smell, we're able to hide some of their food around as well. I'm gonna have to go search for the rest of it. <laughs> Um, so depending on what the animal species is, we may be able to give them things like different types of toys, but um, we do have to make sure that it's suitable and safe for the species that we would be giving it to. Yeah, they keep looking now. Oh. <laughs> so now she's going to keep motoring around and searching around for her food. Now, uh, porcupine species are not considered um, threatened or any um, concern with their populations at the moment. Again, they are the second largest rodent that we have in North America. And um, so they are second to the beaver. One of the big things that I can say in terms of being able to help porcupines in the wild is to ensure that if you are gonna be in any um, really forested, dense forested areas and you happen to notice any type of signs of a porcupine and you have a dog with you, it would be really good to try and keep that dog on the leash as much as possible because if they do happen to encounter a porcupine, um, most dogs don't really um, tend to heed the warnings of a porcupine and I know several people who've ended up with dogs with a mouthful or a face full of quills because they've simply gotten too close. Um, that can result in a lot of pain for the animal but also it's going to leave the porcupine defenseless for several days until they're able to start growing some of those quills back. Um, so in order to make sure that they are safe from natural predators, it's always good to try and keep pets leashed when you're going to be in areas where a porcupine can be found. Some of the obvious uh, signs are going to be loose quills, um, but you may also see chew marks on various types of trees, and you may also see little brown scat. Um, so those are usually the signs that a porcupine is near. 
They are nocturnal um, for most of the year. Um, so you're usually not going to see them too out and active during the times that you would be on a walk. But th there is always some cases. <laughs> As I mentioned, they are usually quite uh, solitary in the wild, but in the winter time, uh, they will typically come together um, and congregate at different food sources. Um, usually they aren't traveling too far than about 100 meters from their den area in the winter for food. And at that time, um, it has been documented to see close to 100 porcupines in the same area. Uh, not for the social aspect of it, but typically just because there's food available for them. And when you have that, uh, that number of porcupines together, the social grouping is called a prickle. <laughs> now, I uh, do also while Quilla is uh, taking her time eating the rest of her pellets there, uh, for those of you who might not know, today is Earth Day. Um, so if you haven't had the opportunity to uh, go out and explore a little bit today, of course, physical distancing, uh, I'd encourage you to do so to get uh, some time away from the screens, of course, once you're finished with our live stream here, um, but to try and go out and um, try to get some Earth time. Um, if you're going out for a walk, I'd encourage you to take a garbage bag and try to pick up some glitter while you're, um, while you're out there. And if you are not able to uh, leave your house, um, still try to encourage you to get some uh, away from the screen time to try and cut down on some of the electronics and some of the power that we're using right now. <laughs> Am I in the frame again? And one of the things that I uh, will hopefully leave you off with while Quilla is still just looking around for some of her food um, is just really for Earth Day and for all of conservation that we can do with wildlife is to try and really reflect on our relationships with wildlife here in BC and across the world. Um, as I mentioned before, um, in the First Nations with uh, with the porcupine and other species, of course, very intertwined. And we can learn a lot from our relationships with wildlife. Um, while I was reflecting on it myself last night in preparation for this, um, one of our stories in regards to uh, the porcupine and how they actually received their quills across their body in Shoe Schwap stories, um, the, the teachings from that story are to do with perseverance and with persistence through hardships and when things get tough to just to keep on going and I know that's a really great message to have right now with all of the COVID-19 and all of the things that we're having to endure right now so um, if there's anything that I can leave you with is just to stay positive and to persevere because I know that we'll be able to get through this all and hopefully everybody will be able to continue to stay healthy and safe. I hope you all enjoyed our first uh, streaming here today and enjoyed learning about Quilla. Hopefully you'll be able to join us for a few coming up in the future. So thank you very much, everybody. And let us know which one you would like for the next live feed. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. <laughs>